M2 MacBook Pro 16 versus Razer Blade 16 2023. Fight! Hey internet, Gordon Ung with PC World here. This is a showdown I've been looking forward to for a while. It's basically Apple's brand new M2 MacBook Pro 16 versus Razer's brand new Razer Blade 16 2023 model. Yes, basically M2 versus Intel 13th gen and NVIDIA RTX 40 series. Before we go too far down this rabbit hole though, I do wanna warn you, this is not the top end MacBook Pro 16. I couldn't get my hands on that one, but honestly, um, the CPU performance doesn't change much between the M2 Pro in this laptop and the M2 Maxes that are out there as well. The GPU does though. Uh, so that may make it a little weird on the GPU side because it's probably unfair to, to do this fight. I will say though, uh, the performance I'm seeing out of the GeForce RTX 4090 laptop GPU in there, it doesn't make me think the uh, M2 Max, either 30 core or 38 GPU core, is gonna make a big difference. But first let's get into the stuff that we can compare that isn't really gonna change from the M2 Pro or the M2 Max and that is performance on the CPUs. We'll kick this off with the familiar Maxon Cinebench R23. It is a 3D rendering benchmark. It is nearly pure CPU. There's a multi-core test. There's a single core test. It likes more cores when it can get them. Uh, and in this case, uh, you're looking at an eight performance core plus four efficiency core for the new M2 Pro versus 24 cores or eight performance cores plus 16 efficiency cores in the Intel. Uh, that's a lot more cores and that pays off as we see Cinebench uh, <laughs> favoring the 13th gen core i9 13950HX uh, by a whopping 79%. Uh, you know, cause basically more cores are better in this benchmark. And when you're looking at, uh, you know, 12 cores versus 24 cores, it, it's just not gonna be pretty. The world isn't only about um, multi-core performance though. A lot of the applications don't really use all the cores. Even if they're brand new, oftentimes they really can't use all the cores in a laptop. So let's also look at Cinebench R23, default run using a single thread on each of these CPUs or a single uh, CPU core for people who like to hear it that way. You're looking at basically, again, a nice win for that 13th gen Core i9 to the tune of 23%, uh, 2022 versus 1647. So uh, pretty sizable win for Intel in Cinebench R23. Moving on to another 3D rendering benchmark, we're looking at Blender Benchmark 3.1. In this case, I'm using the 3.40 engine to render the three scenes at this uh, benchmark uses to measure a performance of a CPU. And as you can see, we saw really big gains for the Intel CPU in the multi-core test, and we're seeing it again in the monster CPU focus. We're looking at, you know, uh, about 49% better samples per minute. Looking at junk shop CPU focused, it's a very sizable 61% improvement for the Core i9 over the M2 Pro. And uh, looking at the classroom CPU focus, it's a 46% improvement for samples per minute, uh, again, for the Intel CPU over the Apple M2. Moving on from 3D rendering onto something people are more likely to do, I'm actually using the recently released Handbrake 1.6.1. It is a free encoder. Go out and download it. It's fantastic. It's available on many platforms. It's also native. Uh, in, in fact, all the tests you've seen so far are native to the Apple M architecture as uh, Handbrake is as well. For this first test, I'm taking Handbrake and I'm taking a 4K file and simply encoding it with X264. It is CPU focused. I set both of the laptops to the same settings within Handbrake. And we see that the Core i9 with the higher core count, generally more cores, uh, Handbrake runs faster, although not to the tune that you're seeing with 3D rendering. We're seeing it finish about 20% faster on the Core i9 versus the M2 Pro. Not everybody encodes the same way. So earlier we did X.264 using the CPU cores. These chips actually have their own 
video encoding engine. So I use Handbrake using Intel's QuickSync, which is built into the 13th gen CPU, or Apple Video Toolbox, which is built into the M2 Pro, uh, basically doing an H.265 10-bit encode of that same 4K file. Uh, again, set the same way on the Mac as well as on the Razer. And we see the PC with QuickSync is about 16% faster than the MacBook Pro. Moving on to an encode that's definitely a little tougher, we're actually gonna use Handbrake 1.6.1 again to do an SVT AV1 encode using 10-bit. This is actually built into Handbrake on both the Mac and the PC. For this, I'm actually using the AV1 preset that's built into the Mac. I use that preset and then I set the PC version to the same settings. For some reason, there was no preset for the AV1 encode, but I basically set it the same way. We're again using that same 4K file and we see uh, again with an all CPU encode, this does not support uh, any hardware acceleration. So you, you can't do it on the media encoders. You could do it potentially on the NVIDIA GeForce card in the Razer Blade, but um, Handbrake doesn't support it yet. So this is a pure CPU encode versus uh, pure CPU encode. And I do want to point out for people who need to know this, SVT AV1 apparently was built by Intel. So there's a little bit of a home field advantage, obviously, but you see the Mac is actually not doing so great here. I'm not really sure why it's, it's doing so poorly because basically <laughs> the razor blade finishes the encode 82% faster in about 635 seconds versus the 3,608 seconds of the MacBook Pro 16. I don't really think uh, this is the, the final word on this. I do think there's probably a problem with Handbrake doing the AV1 on the Mac, but I, I will again say the AV1 preset is actually built in to the Mac, and that's actually what I set the PC to, so I don't quite get it. Um, I would say stay tuned, but if you have to do AV1 using CPU right now, uh, the 13th Gen Core 9 pretty much whoops the M2 Pro. I'll admit 3D rendering and video encoding is kind of nerdy stuff, although if you're gonna buy one of these laptops, you're probably into the nerdy stuff. If you wanna know how these laptops feel and just kind of boring things, I try to get a feel for that by running Babco's Crossmark. Uh, this is again a cross application benchmark as its name implies. It's actually compiled for the different platforms, uh, native on Mac. It's also compiled on Linux and Android and iOS. It tries to give you a performance in productivity, creativity, and responsiveness. Uh, such things as document editing, spreadsheets, web browsing, photo editing, photo organization, uh, video editing, and responsiveness would look at sort of application launches and file opening. So again, this is actually kind of the stuff a lot of people do care about. Uh, they basically write applications on the multiple platforms and then they compile them using native compilers to that platform. So it's about as even as you can get. Overall, the winner is the, the Core i9 and it is mostly CPU. The GPU is not doing much in this uh, benchmark. Uh, the Core i9 is about 12% faster than the M2 Pro. Uh, in productivity, it opens that up to a nice 27% for the Core i9 over the M2 Pro. Interestingly, when we get to creativity, again, we're look, that's where you're looking at photo editing, photo organization, and video editing. The MacBook Pro actually has an advantage to about 10% over the uh, uh, Razer Blade with its Core i9. So, you know, hey, that, that's pretty fair. And overall in responsiveness for opening files, launching applications, uh, it actually favors the Core i9 uh, and the uh, NVMe Gen 4 drives in the Razer Blade to the tune of 45%. Our next test is Primate Labs Geekbench 5.51. It's a multi-discipline test that tests a whole bunch of different uh, applications on the CPU, multi-core and single core. It's free, you can download it. It will upload the results to the internet if you don't pay for it. But we can see the uh, Core i9 with more cores and multi-core performance coming in with about a 33% increase in advantage over the M2 Pro. And in single core, it actually closes up 
Although, you know, Core i9 is still ahead, but I wouldn't say it's a big lead, given that uh, Intel chip about a 5% advantage over the M2 Pro. Uh, one thing I want to note, the brand new version just came out today. I have not had time to fully test it uh, for this. Hopefully we'll run that in the future, take a look at it. But 5.51 is a known quantity and it's been out there for quite a while. Okay, a lot of that stuff before has been kind of theoretical. I mean, except for Cinebench, which is a real application and Blender is real, but most people aren't doing that. Handbrake also real, but I mean, how many people are really doing video encoding? Let's look at something everybody does, and that is browsing the internet. For that, I'm going to use Google Chrome 1.10, and I'm actually going to run four different popular browser-based benchmarks. The first one's from Principal Technologies. It's Web Expert 4. The next three, Jetstream 2, Motion Mark, and Speedometer, are actually developed by the folks who did Apple's Safari browser. So um, they're a little bit of a home field advantage there. In Web Expert, all of these I want to note are very much uh, lightly threaded, single core, maybe two at best, if even. It doesn't really matter. So uh, it's really about how fast these uh, CPUs are under a single core. It doesn't care if there's 24 cores or 12 cores, frankly. In Web Expert, uh, Core i9, 24% faster than M2 Pro. Jetstream 2, about 8% faster. Motion Mark 1.2, 85% faster. However, uh, again, I've seen some weird things on the Mac. I haven't done a lot, a lot of extensive Mac testing in quite a while, but the performance on some ARM parts can be a little weird. This 85% faster makes zero sense to me. In fact, if you look at the actual sub scores of it, like one is just simply stuck at one, which really drags performance down. So that means either Chrome is broken or the actual benchmark, Motion Mark 1.2, is broken with this version of Chrome that I use. Uh, so I really wouldn't say that 85% faster in Motion Mark really means anything right now, but I do have to report it because that's what I got. Speedometer, 4% faster, basically dead even between the M2 Pro and the Core i9. And actually, I will say that's, a, that's actually a pretty good showing for the M2 as well as the uh, Core i9, actually. Here again is something very practical. A lot of people edit photos. Um, Adobe Lightroom Classic is the unsung hero of all photographers. Uh, Photoshop gets all the glory, but uh, Lightroom Classic really does all the work for working photographers. Unfortunately, I would normally do this with Puget Bench, but it doesn't quite work on the ARM-based Macs yet, so I essentially loaded the Adobe Lightroom Classic 12.1. It is native to the Mac. And then I, I took 2,854 Canon RAW files that I've shot over the years on the EOS 5D Mark I, Mark II, Mark III, and Mark IV. Yes, no, no 1D. I don't have a 1D, just a 5D for this. But that's 2,854 RAW files. I take those from the laptop and then I export them all to JPEG at 50% with the uh, simplified copyright watermark. I also apply a light uh, sharpening for screens as it does the export. So it is, uh, you know, the CPU that matters here. Some of it is the GPU and also uh, some of it is the SSD that's here because honestly you are reading and writing a lot of data, but honestly the SSDs in both these laptops are stupendously fast. So that might not be the bottleneck You'll see three results here, which is a little different because we see the blue bar, which is Lightroom running default on the razor blade. If you run it on default, Lightroom on Windows does not support more than one graphics card. So there is actually a portion where it, where it will do GPU exports. By default on auto, it will use the integrated graphics of the 13th gen chip. And using the integrated graphics, and the CPU to do that export. The razor blade actually comes out last at 357 seconds. That's basically 24% slower than the MacBook Pro 16 with the M2 Pro, which is at 270 seconds. So of course the question is, well, what happens if I switch over the razor blade to the GeForce RTX 4090 laptop GPU? 
And I did that because people are going to wonder, so when it does the export, if you change it in uh, the preferences under Adobe Lightroom Classic, it says uh, GPU is now fully enabled. And by the way, on the Mac, because it has an integrated graphics with integrated memory, it's all one. There is no secondary graphics, discrete graphics in, in the Mac. It basically fully enabled for the GPU encode. So the Mac is giving you some GPU, some CPU. When you enable that GeForce RTX 4090, though, uh, the razor blade comes out on top at 167 seconds. That's basically 38% faster than the MacBook Pro 16. And for comparison, the razor blade defaulted to the integrated graphics versus the GeForce it gives the GeForce, the GeForce is a 53% faster export. So big win for the GeForce, but you know, honestly, if you're gonna be running only on integrated graphics, the, the magic of the M2 actually has a nice lead over those Intel parts. Our next test fortunately does run on the Mac. That is Puget Systems Puget Bench 0.956 running Adobe Premiere Pro 23.1.0. This is the standard run. And notice the bars are a little differently colored. Previously, all the bars were blue because they were pretty much all CPU bound tests. On this test, it's really hard to say where the benchmark uses the GPU green for NVIDIA or the CPU blue for Intel, so I colored them both. Uh, both of them added up though, give a pretty good beat down to the Mac. We're looking at a 29% advantage for the Razer Blade overall. Uh, and actually the, the sub score, standard export score is about 21%. Standard live playback score, which does actually use that Intel integrated graphics, 30% faster for the Razer Blade. The effects score, 40% faster. And then when you look at the GPU effects, which I'm going to assume run on the mighty GeForce RTX 4090 laptop GPU, 164% faster than the uh, 19 core GPU in the M2 Pro. So really big advantage for um, the RTX 4090 and the 13 gen Core i9. Of course, where would the M2 Max fall, I don't know, but you can imagine it would pick up some performance because it simply has, you know, 30 or 38 cores depending on which one you buy. So it could pick up some GPU score. I'm not sure it's gonna beat it in the export score or the live playback score, but it could get closer. For today though, a big win for the Razer Blade. Before we move on too far though, I do say video editing, especially on these laptops, is very important and Puget Bench actually produces a lot more data. So I'm gonna throw up this score. It's a big headache uh, list to look at, but it actually kind of tells you where the strengths of the different laptops are. Because when you are editing in something as big and wide as Adobe, it's not really clear where you're gonna get a performance advantage. There are frankly some things where the Mac has an advantage over the Razer Blade, even with the 4090 and the 13 Gen in there. And there's definitely some things where the 13 Gen and 4090 laptop have a big lead as well. I would say the advantage, if you're gonna work with a lot of ProRes, goes to the MacBook Pro. Definitely a lot of the H.264, some of the H.265, and the RED advantage generally goes to Intel and NVIDIA. Uh, of course, you're wondering, well, why does the Mac have such an advantage with uh, ProRes? And I will say that that is the home field advantage. ProRes is a codec created and owned by Apple. I think they're the only ones, in fact, that can actually make accelerators for ProRes. So uh, that is very much a you know, home field advantage. Um, some people on the PC may want to cry, well, that's not fair. I would say whatever if i edit with prores i don't care what you say i just need it done faster but if clearly looking at these results um if you're going to edit a lot of red coverage the 13 gen with the 4090 has a nice advantage over the the macbook with the m2 pro as well so don't just simply see the score above and go like oh my gosh i need to buy this you need to look at what's better for the codecs that you work in Puget Bench actually has a standard run as well as an extended run. I know we're doing a lot on Adobe Premiere, but I will say Adobe Premiere is the 800 pound gorilla of video editors. It is extremely important. It's something that these kind of laptops are kind of made to run. So we actually run the extended uh, run, which actually includes 8K media. And as you can see, the score is uh, 13 Gen Core i9 with RTX 4090 to the tune of 32% over the M2 Pro and the MacBook Pro 16. 
It also has a nice lead in the extended export scores of 47% over the MacBook Pro. Extended live playback score is actually kind of dead even. And because we did the subscore breakdown previously, let's also look at the subscore breakdown here again for the extended run. And you could see, you know, a lot of the leads for the PC come from an 8K H.265 100 megabit export. Overall, the wins are enough that the razor blade gets the nod by Puget Bench upper score. But again, if you look at the details, there are some things you might kind of want uh, the Mac for. But uh, generally, it looks like the razor blade uh, with 13 Gen and uh, the 4090 laptop GPU have the edge. So, you know, early on, I, I gave you the warning that uh, this is uh, the M2 Pro. It's not the M2 Max 30. It's not the M2 Max 38. Uh, and I do want to admit that, that is, uh, that's a problem because, honestly, I really want to see the M2 Max, especially the 38. I've heard amazing things about it, the previous uh, M1 Max, the M1 Ultra. Uh, so, obviously, people are going to say this is unfair. I will admit this, but it is worth looking at it. And I will say, after running this, though, I'm, I'm not con completely convinced that the M2 Max 30 and I'm calling that the 30 because there's a 30 core version, or the M2 Max 38 are going to really even the scales here with the RTX 4090 laptop GPU. Uh, first up is again, the Blender benchmark you saw earlier in blue, but now we are running it on the graphics card, the GPU on the uh, Razer Blade, that RTX 4090 laptop GPU at 175 TGP using the Blender 3.40 version. And it's just simply a crushing, crushing uh, defeat for the M2 Pro. And I don't think the M2 Max is going to change this, whether it's a 38 or 30. Because uh, you're, when you're looking at 4,101 samples versus 382 samples, that's 974% faster for the RTX 4090 laptop GPU. So, yeah, I, I admit... The Max is going to be better. I don't think it's going to make it that much better, though. So we'll have to see if I can get my hands on a Max 30 or a, a Max uh, 38. But I don't think it's going to change. And I will say this is open source free software. This could potentially be, by the way, the people who work on Blender really, really optimized for NVIDIA. This benchmark, you don't get to pick whether it's optics or whatever or metal manually. The benchmark itself picks what to run it on. So I don't really know what it's doing. Um, but I will say if today you need to do GPU-based blenders, you're gonna want the Razer Blade and the RTX 4090 laptop over the Pro and probably over the Max 30 and the Max 38. Earlier you saw Geekbench running the CPU, single core, multi-core. Geekbench also has a compute benchmark. I ran this on both the uh, graphics parts on both of these laptops. I will say uh, Geekbench lets you run either in CUDA, on the CUDA API, which is NVIDIA's thing, or Apple's Metal API. And I also ran it on OpenCL, which is on both platforms. And you can see, again, very, very big wins for that RTX 4090 laptop, uh, 250,847 versus 52,777. That's 375% performance advantage for the RTX 4090 over the M2 Pro with its uh, 19 core GPU. And again, when you're looking at OpenCL, 375% advantage for the GeForce over the M2 part. So, uh, would that M2 Max 30 or Max 38 change its um, score? Yes. Is it enough to defeat the GeForce? I don't think so. In fact, I actually saw some scores for uh, the M2 Max uh, published uh, by our sister publication, Mac World, and I think they were about 80 or 90,000 for Metal for Geekbench 5.51. Uh, 80,000 is not more than 250,000 the last time I checked. So mighty GeForce RTX 4090 laptop GPU, it really is mighty. This next test I really love because it uses the hot word of today and that's AI. It's Topaz Labs Video AI 3.31. It literally came out like about a week and a half ago. For the test, I take a 720p flip cam style grainy low res shaky cam video of my kids from 10 years ago and I 
use AI to upsample it to 1080p. I'm actually using the Thea model for um, video AI as well as Motion Deblur uh, using Themis and that's using AI. For this test, I elected only to use the GPUs because you can use the CPU on this, but I didn't want to wait the five or six hours just to run it once. It's just not worth it because I have to run it multiple times to get an actual accurate result. And I'm not going to do that on the CPU. If you're going to use video AI, don't even bother to screw around with the CPU, run it on the GPU. So again, uh, the results are measured in seconds. The faster it's done, the faster you can do something else. And you can see the Razer uh, Blade 16 with that GeForce RTX 4090 laptop GPU took about 376 seconds versus the MacBook Pro M2 Pro at 2008 seconds. That's about 81% less time for the GeForce RTX 4090. Um, would this change with the M2 Max? Yes, it would definitely get better. It might cut it in half, probably not quite in half, but it definitely will get better. Uh, let's look at a little bit of gaming. And I will say I did do a little bit of gaming on the Mac. I think it's unfair because uh, I like to rely on gaming benchmarks that have built-in benchmarks. They're just simply more reliable. It's, of course, you're, it's this weird non-parity because you have Windows developed by one developer for the PC and then you have somebody porting that to the Mac. And we also have a problem on the Macintosh where a lot of the games are still actually made for Intel-based Macs using x86, and many of them are not actually native to the Mac. So it's, it's really kind of unfair in a way, but you know, I did run one game because honestly people are still running it because they still want to see what it looks like. The first game is Rise of the Tomb Raider, I'm running this at 1900 by 1200 resolution, highest quality setting. A lot of the Mac reviews actually run that at like medium or low. I don't quite get it because it's actually pretty decent at highest quality, but you can see the, um, this again is actually very impressive. I'm, I'm really kind of blown away that it can run Rise of the Tomb Raider, which is made for um, x86 base Intel Macs, and it's, it's cranking out 58 frames a second sent to its highest. I mean. God, that is really impressive. I will say ARM on PC, not <laughs> impressive at all. ARM on Mac is very impressive. And the fact that Apple's ARM chips can push out um, 58 frames a second at 19 by 12 at highest quality settings is very impressive. I'm blown away by that. I do want to say I would not want to play a game like Rise of the Tomb Raider at 1900 by 1200, especially if I have a super beautiful high resolution screen. The Mac monitor is 3456 by 2234. The Razer Blade is 3840 by 2400. Why would you want to play at low resolutions? This game is not an esports game. You really don't need 400 frames a second or 200 frames a second. So here's what it actually looks like on these laptops running at their native resolutions. Uh, the MacBook Pro uh, with the M2 Pro is pushing about 21 frames a second. Uh, the Razer Blade 16 is about 140 frames a second. Again, I do have DLSS uh, on and set the balance, but that's about a 567% advantage for the Razer Blade with the GeForce RTX 4090 laptop and that 13 gen. I turn off DLSS, here's what you get. You see the Razer Blade now kicking it down to about 92 frames a second. The MacBook, of course, is still 21 frames a second because you can't turn DLSS on or off because Apple doesn't offer that on this laptop. That's about a 338% advantage for the Razer Blade. So yeah, you're talking 4K plus at 92 frames a second with DLSS off on the Razer Blade. I'm still stupidly impressed that it runs as fast as it does on the Mac because it's essentially being translated in real time um, using the Rosetta on the Mac. So you, you got to give it to Apple. But no, if you want to play games, primarily play games, do not buy a MacBook. It just does not make any sense. The PC is the superior gaming platform. This proves it, even if we're not dealing with all the other stuff of having the translation stuff. All right, so I, I actually tried a couple games that were Mac native um, to the M1. Uh, I really, I, again, I felt kind of weird because you're, there's no benchmark that you can simply run through and get reliable. You have to rely on 
making sure you have not screwed something up, doing a run through in a game. And I just didn't trust myself to do it with the amount of time I had to do here. Um, so I, but I do want to get a feel like how much is that translation layer killing Mac graphics performance? Uh, we saw that on Tomb Raider, how it wasn't looking so hot. So for that, I'm actually going to use Basemark. It's actually a free benchmark that's out there. It will upload the results, folks. It's a cross-platform, runs on iOS, Android, Windows, and Mac. This is May, uh, Basemark Sacred Heart, uh, the official run, which runs at 2560 by 1440 resolution. I run it on DirectX 12 on the Razer Blade. Uh, I'm running it on Metal on the MacBook. And as you can see, the score for the MacBook Pro with the, uh, uh, with the M2 Pro is about 6,330. The, the GeForce RTX 4090 laptop is 25,689. That's a 306% improvement for the uh, GeForce RTX 4090. Again, that is uh, native to M Silicon, you know, M2, and it's also native to uh, x86. It's also running on Apple's own Metal API. And again, yeah, I, I say uh, M1 Max 30, M1 Max 38, definitely getting improved performance. I mean, 38 basically doubles the the GPU cores, you also increase the memory bandwidth to 400 gigs from 200 gigs. Let's give you, say, 15,000 for the MacBook Pro 16 with an M2 Max 38 in it. Um, that's not better than 25,600. So the GeForce RTX 4090 laptop GPU is all kinds of incredibly fast. And I don't think Max is going to beat it. I would love to see it and, and honestly prove myself wrong, but I don't see it beating the, uh, the GeForce RTX 4090 anytime immediately. And this next one, of course, is just simply the actual scores in FPS. It's the same percentage. You're looking at 256 frames a second at 1440 for the GeForce RTX 4090 versus that M2 Pro. So all of that is all of the performance stuff. And I'm going to tell you, if I were a Mac fan, and I know they're all doing this. Every single Mac fan in this world is sitting on their hands and biting their insides of their cheeks and just biting on their fingernails and they're hammering the desk saying, this is ridiculous. You are comparing a laptop that uses way more power to one that uses way less. I mean, they're basically about the same size, although that one's heavier. Okay, I get it, more power consumption, so let's actually look at a little bit at power consumption. I'm going to do this uh, probably in a way you don't normally see. I think it's an easy way to do it, especially given the amount of time I had to do this. I basically hook up logging watt meters to both of these laptops. This baby, by the way, has a 330 watt GAN power brick. It's actually really small, but it's 330 watts. The MacBook Pro 16 has a 140 watt USB-C power brick, so considerably less power for the Mac. I basically set the screen brightness to the same brightness, about 450 nits, and then I did some testing of this pure CPU, pure GPU, to see how much power it would consume. With the, my theory, and this should work out right, is if the battery is full, none of the power is going into the battery. So any of the power that the laptops are using are directly going into the silicon, the GPU, the CPU, as well as the panel, but that's pretty constant. So we basically see how much power these laptops will consume when they are plugged in while running the particular benchmarks. And because I'm doing it externally, there's no observer effect. I'm not actually slowing down the benchmarks because I'm trying to record what things are doing. So I'm doing this completely independent of the laptop. It has no idea that I'm recording what's going on. So you're seeing Max on Cinebench R23. It's a familiar benchmark. It is the default 10 minute loop. That blue line on top, because this is a CPU benchmark, is Cinebench running that razor blade up from, you can see the idle with Cinebench open is about maybe 30, 32 watts, 33 watts. It kicks all the way up uh, until about 190 watts. And you can see it kind of climbs up for a little bit, drops a little bit, climbs up a little bit, and then drops and then is constant. The Mac, meanwhile, with Cinebench open, it's idling at about 16 to 18 watts. It's actually a very low idle. Pretty amazing, right? So very low idle. 
you fire off Cinebench R23, it basically tops out at about 60, 63 watts, maybe 65 watts, and basically sits there the whole time. So <laughs> the razor blade to get its performance while running Cinebench is roughly, you can look at most of the time, consuming at about 175 watts, whereas the, uh, the MacBook Pro 16 is about 60 watts. So considerably less power for the MacBook Pro. So, you know, if you wanna conserve energy, that MacBook Pro 16 is gonna conserve quite a bit of energy. I do wanna point out though, if you're wondering what those little squiggly lines are, the way Cinebench R23 runs, is it renders a frame. When it's done, it goes back to the beginning and renders it again. It does this for 10 minutes. Once the 10 minute timer hits, it finishes the last frame. So every time you see one of those squigglies drop or rise is when the clock, when the benchmark is done and it resets everything. So you can see that in the time that uh, this benchmark is run, the Razor Blade 16 renders 20 frames because there's 20 little squiggly drops for the razor blade with the core uh, i9-13950HX. The uh, MacBook Pro 16 with the M2 Pro renders about 11 frames. So if you're a 3D rendering artist and you're rendering a lot of art in you know, cin Cinema 4D, you're basically getting almost twice the amount of frames rendered on the razor blade than you are on the MacBook with the M2 Pro chip in it. So that is something to consider. So significantly more power consumed by that core i9 and also significantly more performance too. It all kind of depends on what you're really looking for. So that previous test was looking at power consumption of the Core i9, uh, that 24 core CPU under an all CPU core load. This next one, I kind of want to look at the GPU. So I use Basemark uh, running Sacred Heart and I'm looping it 10 times. Uh, unlike some other benchmarks, the way uh, Sacred Heart Basemark works, is it basically jams through the, the, the benchmark as fast as it can. If it's hitting 100 frames a second, it does 100 frames a second. The, say if you're running that 10 times, it's gonna render you know, 1,000 frames and then it's done. So basically, fire it off. As soon as you're done, you're finished. And you're seeing that here where the green line is again that razor blade. You can see where idle has changed a little bit because with the base mark, uh, looks like we're maybe about 35, 40, 40 watts. <clears throat> we climb all the way up to, the GPU, by the way, uses more power than the CPU, just under 250 watts. So that GeForce RTX 4090 laptop GPU, when plugged in, will <laughs> run it all the way up to about 250 watts. It's so close, let's call it 250 watts. The M2 Pro with its 19 GPU cores, however, is you know similar we're looking at about 50 what 55 looks like maybe 60 65 watts overall so you know 250 watts for the 19 core m2 pro versus the 250 watts so significant less power for the m2 pro and you can imagine i would really love to see the max on this because an m2 max 30 or a m2 max 38 I do wonder if they would actually get up to, you know, closer to 100 watts on the M2 Max 38. It'd be pretty cool to see. And I also do want to point out the same thing you saw earlier with Cinebench you're seeing here. Uh, the razor blade basically fires up that benchmark, does 10 loops of it at 250 watts, and then is just done, kicked back reading the paper. Uh, meanwhile, the M2 Pro with its 19 GPU cores is running and running and running and running. It takes considerably longer to finish the exact same uh, workload because it is, it is considerably slower. It also does save considerably more power too. So again, significantly more performance versus significantly less power used. Moving on to something a lot lighter. We previously saw something hammer the GPU or hammer the CPU. Those are sort of worst case scenarios for these laptops. What does it look like on these laptops if you're doing something really, really kind of boring, kind of normal? Browsing the web, for example. So for that, I'm again recording the power consumption of these laptops uh, using Google Chrome uh, version 1.10. We're gonna run Principal Technologies Web Expert 4, and you can see that um, actually the Razor Blade, the power consumption with Chrome just fired up is just under about 40 watts. 
and you can see this behavior. I've seen this similarly on other Intel laptops, um, looking at sort of battery consumption. Intel laptops are very spiky. They, they like to really get on that clock, boost the clocks up as high as they can, and then let it drop off. It's like getting on the gas as fast as you can. You can see all those kind of boosts. As something really needs the CPU to clock up, it clocks up, uses power, drops down. You can see all those boosts where you're seeing up to 60 watts, up to 80 watts, even up to 100 watts during this benchmark where it basically says we need more, crank those clocks up. Maybe it's using two cores, crank it up, we'll get up to 100 watts. Um, you know, but actually overall, if you actually run a razor blade like this in browsing, it's actually not as bad. So you're not gonna consume the power you would under an all CPU core, an all GPU core. So, you know, honestly, the browsing performance is not gonna be horrible. But the thing that really should floor you though is that black line, because that is the MacBook Pro 16 running the M2 Pro using the same load again, Chrome 1.10. We are browsing the internet and you can see just having Chrome open doing nothing, it's idling at about 20 watts. And that damn thing never leaves 20 watts. It's actually incredible. Well, that Intel chip is like, hey, I need 80 watts. I need 60 watts of boost. It's just, I need 100 watts of boost. It's just simply running it up. That M2 Pro is almost 20 watts the entire time. I will say that's incredible. There are a few spikes where it'll push it up to 30 watts, but look at that thing. It's just basically browsing the web, humming along, never using any power. This performance is shockingly amazing. And it is something that I, as a PC fan, and I, I think things all PC, this is very, very impressive. It's something the PC should strive for. Um, so, hey, hooray. Yeah, it loses, honestly, uh, in the actual performance. We'll look at that later. But it's just amazing that the Mac can do the mundane stuff. And this is why people say when they can get on their MacBook and just sit there all day and browse the web and the battery lasts forever, <laughs> that's the kind of thing is gonna make you think it's gonna last forever. All right, our last actual practical performance test um, where we only look at power is something, again, something important. I think Adobe Premiere is something everybody really does care about because the world is about internet. Somebody's gonna edit this on a computer, although it'll be DaVinci, but they're gonna edit on the computer they're gonna put it on the internet. So if you're doing this on a laptop on battery, what does it look like? So again, I basically recorded the power consumption of these laptops the same way I did before, running Puget Bench uh, Premiere Pro. This is just the standard run. I didn't do the extended run. And again, you could see uh, the razor blade and I colored it blue and green because it is a combination of Intel CPU and NVIDIA GPU. You can see we're spiking up to 150 watts, uh, 200 watts, 250 watts. There, there was even times we're pushing 300 watts and an occasional, amazing to me, we're pushing the absolute max wattage of the power supply. It, is a, it has a 330 watt power supply on the razor blade. You see it actually spikes above 300 watts, probably running into basically, oh, there's no more power to come from that power brick. So it's just actually amazing to me that the power the amount of power that the razor blade is is using here um, and again look at the look at that black line for the the macbook pro it's it's like it's it's under 50 watts it's actually truly amazing if you're going to edit all day in premiere uh, the macbook uh, pro 16 is going to clean the clock of that razor blade uh, uh, probably uh, if you're going to be running it on battery and uh, I do want to point out though, there, I pointed out on this chart, uh, there's a section where it says GPU heavy effect section and a part where it says GPU heavy effect section for the Mac. That's the same thing we saw previously. Uh, basically, uh, Puget Bench is running the GPU effects section and then it's done. And we can clearly see the advantage. That's where you're running GPU heavy effects section on a GeForce RTX 4090 laptop. It's done in a really fast, it's done in a quarter, less than a quarter of the time of the MacBook. That takes considerably more. So it's very interesting to look at because uh, the performance that you're getting there on the razor blade is amazing, but it comes at a huge price cost. And of course, you've seen how much power the razor blade consumes running on AC. 
when you're in a thin laptop like that, that also means fans. Fans mean noise. Thin laptops with fans mean more noise. So I did want to try to find out how much noise it makes because, you know, MacBook, MacBook Pro people like to get in our face about how quiet the MacBook Pro is. It would be flatly unfair to not also look at the noise levels of the MacBook Pro 16. So um, I, again, am doing the same test as previously in a way because the purple line represents the power consumption of the razor blade. We are pushing on that CPU, you know, up over 150 watts. We actually push up to about 180 watts until it burns off the boost. Squigglies for the how fast it is, yay, how fast it is. But I also, at the same time, measured the sound level of the fans. I did this in my garage. I do not have an anechoic chamber. That would be the ideal way to do it. And the noise floor in my garage is about 33 uh, dBA. You can see if you're looking at the on the left is watts, on the right is the audio levels, and you can see we're basically at about 33 dBA. Um, and that red line on the left, we start running Cinebench. There's a delay as the laptop heats up. It then tells, hey, by the way, I need more cooling. Yay, fans turn on. So the noise actually comes on after the performance is going. And you can see actually the way the Core i9 13 Gen runs is it runs it really hard and then it realizes, oh, I'm running really hot. It comes back down. Uh, the fans actually uh, kick up to a higher level. We're actually pushing about 52 to 53 dBA with the fans going full tilt. But because the CPU in the uh, razor blade is now said, you know what, I'm not gonna run the rest of this load at that higher boost because it's too much for us. We're gonna run it at a lower, lower uh, clock speed, lower TDP. So now the actual fans tune down. So most of the run is actually about 51 dBA versus 53 to 54 dBA. So most of the time, 51 dBA for the razor blade. Uh, I will say I've heard far more offensive laptops, especially when you get that thin, especially with previous gen hardware in it. That is not bad. 51 dBA though is still considerably louder than no noise. So uh, I just want to mention that that's how I recorded it for the razor blade. So let's do this for the Mac now. So we're gonna reset the graph. You're gonna see the same thing we just did for the razor blade 16 with the MacBook Pro 16. And it looks quite a bit different because again, that purple line is the power. We're actually pushing over 50 watts for Cinebench for this all CPU run. The squigglies are for all the times that it resets and runs again. Okay, you see that it's considerably shy of that, you know, 150 or some odd watts of the Intel CPU, definitely better, you know, in power consumption. Uh, the red line, again, just like we saw with the razor blade, is the sound level. Remember I said my garage in the daytime, the floor level is about 33 dBA. Well, um, if you're living in a metropolitan area and you're in your garage, there's going to be other sounds. So the red line is basically the sound, 33 dBA. Uh, that spike you see I've labeled. That's the sound of a crow in the street. There's some sound of a car going down the street. There's that crow again. And then at some point, my uh, wife started to wash the dishes up, Sarah. Every time you turn, every time there's that weird spike, she turned on the water to get, uh, get water in the sink. And then at the end, there's street traffic. And basically, the MacBook Pro 16 M2 Pro, the fan never comes on. And that is under a very heavy all CPU load that has a razor blade kicking it up to, you know, 54 dBA, 51 dBA. It's, I mean, it's basically dead silent, whereas the razor blade is making quite a bit more racket. I mean, obviously, <laughs> 51 dBA versus no noise is a huge win for the Mac. If you care about noise, MacBook's got a big advantage. All right, home stretch, folks. If you stuck with us, we got a couple good things I think you want to care about. And this is something, again, Mac fans have been like, hey, uh, I want to know about performance on battery. If you unplug the razor blade, there's no way that sucker is going to give you all that performance running on battery that it does running on its 330-watt power brick. And I will say, yeah, that makes sense. I agree. One thing you need to note, though, is that's not the same for everybody. Every laptop vendor tunes how their laptop will run on battery life. If they've decided on the Razer Blade to only give you balance, CPU and GPU performance, kick on whisper mode, 
That's different than what Dell or Lenovo or HP or Asus or MSI may do. Some laptop vendors may say, hey, we will give you control. If you want to crank that sucker up, you can do it. I will say the razor blade does not. It gives you basically balanced and no options to increase the power under AC. I think that's kind of a bummer. Some other vendors may do that. But when we're looking at Razer Blade 16 versus MacBook Pro 16, unplugged performance still actually matters. So first up, you're seeing the results of um, the Razer Blade 16 and the MacBook Pro 16 running max on Cinebench R23. I know there's a lot of Cinebench, but the reason I like to use it is everybody's familiar with it. It's very predictable. This obviously would be similar to other benchmarks. Um, you see we got that amazing score of 26,424 running when it's plugged into the wall. Unplug that razor blade though and you have no control over it, at least right now. They may change that later because if they hear some belly aching from people who want max performance on battery, you unplug it and you drop down to 12,631. That is a 52% decrease for the Core i9-13950HX. And again, let me remind you, that is the decision by Razer. Some other laptops may say like, go for it. Either more power, less power, or do as you will to your battery. So considerably less, and actually at 12,631, we're actually below the performance of the M2 Pro which does not change. In fact, it, it's almost going up a little bit, but honestly, that's just simply run-to-run -run variances. It's basically no different. MacBook Pro, 16 plugged in, unplugged, same thing. Uh, very amazing, because you're seeing a 52% drop for that Core i9. Let's do the same thing for the GPU, though. That green bar, we saw that incredible 25,689 you unplug that GeForce RTX 4090 laptop GPU, by the way, with a 175 watt TGP, and performance falls back by 75% to 6,483. So 75% power nerf going to battery. Um, I will say though, that's actually the same score as at M2 Pro. Uh, basically, it's actually a little bit faster. 6483 is still faster than 6333, but basically the, the M2 Pro and the MacBook Pro 16 just don't change. So yeah, you will, if you're gonna run on battery life, you will lose considerable amount of performance. But I will note the Core i9 is actually pretty close in performance to the M2 Pro and that uh, GeForce RTX 4090, even with its unplugged power nerf, it's actually still faster than the, than the M2 Pro. So that's something worth noting as well. And I also wanna point this out, uh, that's because you're running all cores or all CPU, all GPU. If you're actually running very light loads, uh, the performance isn't as bad. In fact, here, I'm gonna run Cinebench R23 using a single thread on the razor blade. And you see, we only see about a 3.3% difference. It's basically almost within the margin of error. So on single threaded performance, the razor blade is not going to change. So a lot of lightly, light editing, Office, Chrome, even Photoshop, very lightly threaded. A lot of things in, in Lightroom when you're just editing things, not going to change. When you do those exports though, you hit all the cores or you hit that GPU hard, you're going to take a big power nerf. And also looking at browsing, um, you're looking at a 7.7% decrease for the razor blade and web expert on battery versus plugged in. And its score of 300 is still better than the MacBook Pro 16 score of 266 on battery. So it's actually still slightly outperforming that MacBook even on DC. So there is nuance. You just simply can't say, oh, it takes a big hit. Yeah, it takes a big hit on their CPU heavy and all GPU core heavy loads. But if you're gonna get to light loads, it can get a little closer. Okay, I'm gonna close this off with actually the thing that kind of surprised me. Uh, and again, this is part one. This is all performance stuff. I'm gonna get to hopefully some battery testing at the end. Um, this is one battery test that I had time to do late last night. I basically said, you know what? So let's take these laptops, charge them up to 100%, set the screen brightness to the same, about 245 nits, and I set the screen so they could not change based on the environment. Turn off the keyboard backlight, put them in airplane mode. And then I basically set both of them 
to loop Cinebench R23 for 9,999 minutes. So basically an all CPU core load all the time until the battery died. You hear a lot of talk about the MacBook Pro 16 and the MacBook Pro having amazing battery life. I'm not seeing that here, especially under an all, all core load. I will say it still did win, but you know, look, you're looking at uh, you know about 7,797 uh, seconds before the battery tapped out versus uh, 6,863. It's about 13.6% improvement for the MacBook uh, Pro 16 over the razor blade, but I, you know, 13.6% is that really? That's kind of like you know, life changing kind of experience. I'm not so sure it's there. And I will also point out the MacBook Pro has a you know 99.9 .9 watt hour battery, the largest you can have, and still bring it on a plane. The razor blade has a 95 watt hour battery, so it's about you know 5% smaller. So that. 13% improvement under an all-core load. I don't think that's a huge advantage for the MacBook. But I, I will say, I think if you're sitting there browsing, if you're sitting there doing very light loads, MacBook probably gonna look pretty good. If you're actually gonna sit there and basically hammer this thing and in encodes, 3D rendering, you know, all-core, all GPU rendering, all things that really, really load up that M2 Pro, as impressive as it is, it's still only a 100 watt hour battery and you know, the best you can get, you know, you might get, you know, a couple hours, you might get a couple hours that depending on what you're doing. So I think the misconception people think that the, the Macs have this huge advantage over PC laptops over, you know, in battery life. From what I'm seeing from this test and what I've kind of seen previously, I don't really think that's true. I think people are seeing certain things and running with it. I think there's a lot more nuance to it because clearly, you know, having 13% better battery life with the 5% bigger battery is really not a big deal. So that's it for the testing. I'm hoping to do more battery rundown tests. That takes quite a bit of time because you got to charge them up, run them down hours and hours and hours of work. Hopefully that comes later, but let's do a quick overview of the laptops, what I think of them, what you should buy basically based on this. Um, first, let's go over the, the shocking thing. Uh, the price, the more expensive laptop here, Macs have traditionally been sky high in pricing. Razor Blade 16 would like to tell you something about price because with a 13 Gen Core i9 13950HX GeForce RTX 4090 laptop GPU, 4K plus panel, by the way, that's neat because it does 120 hertz mode and a 240 hertz mode at a lower resolution and also mini LED, 32 gigs of DDR5, two terabytes of Gen 4 storage. That baby is gonna set you back $4,300. Yeah, that is a, that is a premium priced laptop. Uh, of course, you are getting all kinds of ass kicking performance when plugged into the wall. That is no doubt. But I mean, compare that to the MacBook. This uh, MacBook Pro 16 with M2 Pro, 32 gigs of RAM, two terabytes of storage, uh, the high resolution screen, mini LED, they're the same on all of them. That's going to take you back $3,500. So the razor blade is $800 more than the uh, uh, MacBook Pro 16. And what's even crazier, if you go for the MacBook Pro 16 with the M2 Max, say if you go for 32 gigs of RAM, two terabytes of storage, <laughs> it's still $400 less at uh, 3,900 than the Razer Blade. You can really jam up the uh, Razer Blade, uh, the, the Mac 2 by, if you wanted to go up to 96, gigs of RAM because of that unified memory design and go to eight terabytes of storage, you can get a real Apple price of $6,500, but that's with eight terabytes of storage and 96 megs, 96 gigs of RAM. So uh, clearly the razor blade is not for the faint of heart in price. Uh, other specs that I think are actually worth calling out. I love this. Uh, again, the laptop uh, power bricks matter. This is very nice. It's a USB-C power brick, 140 watts to be respected because it's just basically a very advanced USB PD charger, very tiny. The laptop barely, I've never saw this thing use over 80 watts. But I also have to give it to Razer. 
because this is a 330 watt GAN power brick and typically those are maybe twice the size of those. This is actually an extremely tiny power brick considering that it is 330 watts. Look, this is 140 versus this 330. It's considerably smaller than what you would expect because it is using very advanced GAN technology. You gotta give that to Razer. Also, the Razer gives you more Type A ports. It actually gives you three Type A. I just wanna mention that. Only one Thunderbolt and one USB-C. Uh, the other one is not Thunderbolt. The Mac, however, gives you uh, three Thunderbolt 4s, and that's it. There's a headphone jack, so in, jack, in the jack department, it's losing. I also should mention the weight. Uh, this matters, too. The Mac is considerably uh, lighter. Uh, the MacBook itself comes in at about 4 pounds, 12 uh, ounces. I just weighed it. Uh, with its power brick, you're pushing about uh, 5 pounds, uh, 7.5 ounces. The Razer Blade 16, however... It's pushing five pounds, eight ounces by itself. You throw in that 330 watt uh, power brick and you are now pushing seven pounds and uh, nine ounces. So I think if you really, for if you're thinking about portability, the MacBook's going to win. It's just simply lighter. It is thinner, which I don't think really matters as much, but it is lighter overall, especially when you're considering the total weight of the package in your bag. I think also, um, well, one, Here's the answer. If you're looking for a laptop to use Final Cut, to use uh, applications that only run on Mac OS, by the way, buy a Mac because you have no choice. If you are looking for a, <laughs> an Apple Macintosh laptop, buy the Mac. That is actually the biggest reason to buy this. Uh, there are other reasons, though, that a little bit of crossover. If you're going to run um, video editing, mostly disconnected. If you're going to be, say, like in the field and your ability to get to a, a charger is going to be very difficult, I would definitely recommend the MacBook Pro 16 over the Razer Blade. If you're going to, however, the Razer Blade is going to just give you all kinds of incredible performance in gaming. For one thing, yes, you can play games sort of on the Mac. The performance is especially much better than I would expect on a Mac, but if you are buying a MacBook to be a 90% gamer, you are simply doing it wrong. It makes zero sense. If you want a gaming experience, you buy the Razer Blade. There is just simply no comparison. It doesn't make any sense to buy a MacBook to play games. The Razer Blade simply cleans the clock in performance, in library, in everything and mods that you can do on the PC gaming that runs on the Razer Blade. So clearly, the Razer Blade, better for gaming. It's also simply better for all-out performance. You saw those benchmarks if you're doing, you know, uh, 3D rendering on the GPU, you're doing rendering on the CPU, you're doing uh, Topaz Labs Video AI. There's just so many things that the Razer Blade gives you in all-out performance that the, the M2 Pro in the MacBook Pro 16 simply really can't get close enough to to really justify. I just don't understand why. I mean, yes, the M2 Max will help it, but you just simply saw the benchmarks. It's just going to be hard for it to compete when plugged into the wall because, you know, they're taking that power and they're giving the performance. A lot of Mac fans will say, well, look, performance really suffers when you unplug that razor blade. And if I were a razor blade fan and said, hey, when I plug in my razor blade, I get more performance, significantly more performance. I plug in my Mac and I'm no longer power limited. Why am I not getting more performance? And you're just simply not getting it on the MacBook Pro 16 with the M2 Pro in it. So, and that's very fair. It just depends on what angle you're coming from. So for gaming, razor blade. And if you actually just want a laptop that gives you, you know, stupendous battery life where you're just kind of doing light tasks. I, I think actually the, the MacBook Pro 16 is a good choice as well. And of course, it is simply the better Mac OS based laptop. So that's my feeling right now based on the performance. I hope you think this was fair. I know some Mac fans are going to say, oh, you should have had the M2 Max. You saw those numbers. Somebody get me an M M2 Max 38. I don't think it's going to be that razor blade, but hopefully we can find out. In the meantime, come back to PC World's channel for more awesome PC coverage. And of course, go to PCWorld.com for news of the day and deals of the day.